Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Wakefield here. Again, uh, looking at 10.3 now. And remember, this is the last of the four different uh, methods that we're looking at for solving quadratic equations. The very last one. So we'll be done with that after this section. We'll even kind of do a little bit of a, a recap here at the end of this video as well, because it's the, uh, the, last, uh, the last method. So anyway, let's jump into it here. Let's look at this method first, and then we'll, we'll talk about kind of summarizing everything. Um, the quadratic formula is the method here, and what it basically is is it's this big formula down here. Okay, we'll learn how to use it. Don't worry. Um, at the beginning of the problem, though, it's kind of like the factory method where you have to put all the terms on one side. See how it says that you have to put it in this form right here, and you got to use this form. So see how they got all the terms on one side with zero on the other side. Doesn't mean that it has to look exactly like this, okay? Sometimes the x term could be missing. That's okay. Sometimes this term without the variable in it, that could be missing too. Now this term can't be missing because if it was, then it wouldn't be a quadratic equation. Because remember, a quadratic equation is when the highest exponent is 2, right? So you can't be missing that one, otherwise it would no longer be quadratic. But these, uh, one of these two terms could be missing sometimes. But the important thing is that you put all the terms on one side with a zero on the other side. If you don't do that, this formula will give you the wrong answer. Okay, so we don't want that, obviously. Um, so let's get into it here. Uh, you can see here that these three terms are not on the same side like they're supposed to be here. Okay, now... Um, this isn't completely mandatory, but it's the way it's usually done, and it's the way the back of the book does it. So, like, when you look at your answers and you check to see if they're correct in the back of the book, uh, you're going to want to do this. Similar to what we did in the factory method, you're going to want to um, put all the terms on one side in such a way that the square term is positive. So since the square term currently has a coefficient of negative 5, you're going to want to move that one over here, and therefore, um, you're going to want all the terms to be over there, okay? Because uh, the R squared term needs to move in order for it to become a positive term, and therefore, all the terms need to be over there because they all need to be on the same side, right? So how do we do that when there's no parentheses? And if there are parentheses like in this problem, then we'll talk about that when we get to this, okay? But if there's no parentheses, then what we do, like we said before, is you add or subtract them over like this but make sure to put them in the right order here as well kind of like what we did with uh, the factory method so we want to say 5r squared plus 8r and it's going to be plus because 8r is positive but you got to have the plus in front of it now because 8r is no longer the first term on that side of the equal sign Okay. Remember, these are not like terms, so you got to still have pluses and minuses separating them Okay, when they're not like terms, like we talked about a lot in the last couple sections. Uh, and since 8R is positive, you now have to put a plus in front. Uh, and then minus 2. 2 is negative, so you still have a minus there in front of that. You now have 0 on the other side because everything moved over and canceled out over there. Now it looks like... This method right here, the only difference is that it's r squared and r instead of x squared and x. But that's okay. Uh, it's just a different letter. It's still the same idea. Okay. Uh, so in other words, if you have a variable squared, whether it's x squared or r squared, and then after that you have a variable to the first power, okay, in this case it's r to the first, just like x to the first, and then you have a term with no variable at all right here, Okay, and it's okay if it's plus or minus. We talked about that before in a previous thing. It's the same thing here. It's okay for the uh, these pluses to be minuses as well. That qualifies. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so you can see that this is in the correct form right here. So we are ready now to do this formula. The only difference <clears throat> with this formula here is that because the variable is r instead of x, we're going to say that it's r equal to this big fraction. So let's write that down. R, and then before I start figuring out what this big fraction is equal to, what is the A, B, and C numbers equal to? Let's write that down off to the side over here. A, B, and C. Okay, A, B, and C are simply the coefficients uh, in this order right here when you write it in the correct order. Uh, so it's going to be what? It's going to be 5, 8, and negative 2. 
like this. Okay. So make sure the terms are in the correct order here so that the A, B, and C thing doesn't throw you off. But can you see now, you guys, that um, these numbers would be different if you had not moved these terms over first? If you hadn't moved these terms over first to put them all on one side, these two terms would have been a different sign than they currently are now. Two previously was positive, now it's negative. Uh, five previously was negative, now it's positive. Okay, that's why I said that if you don't move all the terms over first, you're going to get different numbers, and therefore you're going to get a different wrong answer. Okay, so that's why it's important to move over those terms first. Okay, now let's go ahead and get started here. Negative b... Negative b means negative 1 times b, and any time that you multiply something by negative 1, it just means that it's just going to change its sign. So the 8 becomes a what right there? It becomes a negative 8. Okay, plus or minus, I'm just uh, taking it right off the formula, plus or minus is next. And then after that we got a radical, a big one here. Uh, let's go ahead and plug those numbers in carefully here. You don't have to plug in the 8 right here. You can just multiply by negative 1 right away. That's not going to be an issue. You can do that. But you do want to be careful about plugging in the numbers here. Okay, that's a little more complicated. So anytime we plug in numbers, as we learned back in the function uh, section that we did, section 4.6, you want to use these empty parentheses, okay, uh, and then put the numbers inside of them. So replace the B, the A, and the C with the empty parentheses, and then put the appropriate numbers, okay, the 8 goes in the place of B, the 5 goes in the place of A, and then the negative 2 goes in the place of C. Um, and that's the radical. Then on the bottom, again, replace the A with an empty parenthesis there, and then just put the 5 inside of there, because A is equal to 5. Okay, so now we got this big gigantic fraction, right? Okay, so now uh, what we need to do is figure out what it's equal to. Notice the fraction doesn't have any variables in it. But r is by itself, and that's what we always want. We always want the, the variable by itself when we're asked to solve a, a one-variable equation. All right, so we have the variable by itself, but we got to figure out this big, huge thing that it's equal to. It's got no variables in it, so we can do that by order of operations. Order of operations says when you got one big fraction, the whole answer is one big fraction, it says to figure out what the top and bottom are equal to first, and then try to uh, put it in lowest terms after that, if that's possible. Okay, so we're going to do that. So the bottom here, that's the easy part, obviously. That's the part that's just uh, two numbers being multiplied. That's 10. Okay, and I made that too big. It doesn't need to be that big. Okay, but the bottom is 10. The fraction is going to get smaller here. That's why I'm making this smaller. Uh, and then on the top, um, you have to figure out the inside of a radical, what it's equal to, before you can figure out the square root. Okay. Um, in other words, you got to know what the inside of the radical is equal to before you can figure out the square root, right? Uh, and then after that, you can add or subtract, which is what these two things mean, plus and minus. Okay, in this case, it means uh, add and subtract. Um, so, the inside of the radical first, then compute the square root if you're able to, and then add and subtract. Okay, so let's do the inside of the radical first. The inside of the radical has an exponent, it has some multiplication, and it has some subtraction right here in the middle. So we do it in that order, PEMDAS, right? Okay, PEMDAS means exponents come before multiplication, right? And then the subtraction goes last. So the exponent is 64, isn't it? All right, actually I don't even need to write down the square root here. We're gonna put it back in the square root, okay, in a minute. Um, Something here that I want to help you uh, uh, with to make sure you don't make any uh, mistakes here, though, is, um, and we talked about this a little bit when we were doing the function problems, the f of x problems, okay, when you have two terms right here, okay, and you're going to plug numbers into it, if the second term is negative, remember that that is the, the same thing as b squared plus negative 4ac, 
All right, we saw something similar to that in the function section where we plug numbers into the function, the f of x, and we had a negative uh, term and it wasn't the first term. And so we thought of that as plus negative four times whatever you plugged in after that being multiplied by it. Um, so we're going to do the same thing here. So the way I want you to think of this right here, again, b squared plus negative 4ac is the same thing here, 64 plus negative 4 times 5 times negative 2. So the way you want to do this is you want to do negative 4, not 4, but negative 4 times 5 times negative 2. Figure that out. And then that is going to be added to the 64, okay, because it's plus negative 4 times AC. All right. So negative 4 times 5 is negative 20. Negative 20 times negative 2 is 40. But remember, it's supposed to be added. So you don't just leave this blank right here. You got to put the plus right there, okay, because, again, it is plus negative 4 times whatever you plugged in behind that. All right. Um, so don't forget to put down that plus if it ends up being a positive answer because you're adding a positive 40 there. All right. Uh, because if you don't put that plus there, it, a lot of students get confused and they think it's 64 times 40 because they don't see anything in between. Well, they need to have the plus in between because, like I said, it's addition. OK, um, so if you're adding whatever that answer was when you multiply those three numbers, then you've got to put the plus there. Okay, if it had been negative, then you would put minus because let's say, for example, let's say it had been negative 40. Okay, then it would, it would be plus negative 40. Well, that's the same thing as minus 40. And so putting a minus there would be fine in that case. Okay, but if it's positive, you got to put that plus there. So what is 64 plus 40? It is 104. So the inside of the radical is 104. Now, Here's the thing, you guys. If the inside of the radical at this point is not a perfect square number, we know what perfect square numbers are, right? 4, 9, 16, 25, all of those different types of numbers, right? Okay, that we've seen uh, many times uh, in other problems before. Um, and so um, 104 is not one of those numbers, is it? 100 is a perfect square number. 121 is a perfect square number, but not 104. When that happens, you guys, all you have to do, and then you're done with the problem, because you can't go any further, and I'll show you why, is to simplify the radical. So you can't figure out what the radical is equal to because you don't have a perfect square number underneath it. If it had said square to 9, then yes, you could say, oh, hey, that's equal to 3, right? Okay, but not, you can't do that with 104. So I simplify this when that happens, when it doesn't have a perfect square underneath. Uh, we have 4 works for this, 4 times 26, and so the 4 becomes a 2 on the outside, doesn't it? And so then you go back and you just simply replace the 104 radical with this. Let me do that. Okay. And now we're done. Let me tell you why we're done. Okay. Normally, when we do order of operations, we keep on going, right? Okay. Until we got an, a an actual answer that's either just a number or it's just a fraction with just a single number on the top and bottom. The problem with that, though, this time is that these aren't like terms. Remember, it says add and subtract. Okay. That means that these things have to be like terms in order to combine them together, in order to make them into one number or at least a smaller thing, a smaller term anyway. You can't even combine these, though, because a regular term that doesn't have a radical in it, as we've talked about before, cannot be combined with a term that has a radical in it. Remember, the 2 is a part of the radical term. Okay, When you have a regular term being multiplied by the radical, remember the 2 is a part of the radical term All right, when it's being multiplied by the radical. And so because this ter term right here, this one right here, that one, and this one, those two terms are not like terms right there. You cannot go any further. All right. So when that happens, um, you just stop because you can't, you can't uh, go any further with it. You can't do any more of the order of operations here. All right. So here's the big thing, and you're going to see this a lot. Not on all problems, but on a lot of them. 
If you figure out what the radical is equal to, you guys, and you get a, a number that is not a perfect square underneath the radical, then all you got to do is simplify the radical, and then you're going to be done at that point because you won't be able to go any further. You'll have a regular term here that doesn't have a radical in it on the left, and then you'll have a, a radical term on the right. You won't be able to combine it, and so you'll be stuck. You won't be able to take it any further. Okay, You do not put it into your calculator. Some textbooks ask you to do that sometimes, but um, that's just going to give you a messy, uh, approximated answer. We don't want that right now. We're just going to go with this, okay? So that's what we're going to do. Now, in the next problem, we will get a perfect square underneath the radical. So I'll show you how to handle that when that happens. But if you don't, then you just have to simplify the radical and you're pretty much done. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, problem B. Notice that uh, the C term is missing here. You've got the variable being squared. You've got the variable to the first power, just like you have x squared and x to the first power. But this part right here is missing. That's okay. Remember I said that's okay, that it's missing. As long as you have all the terms on one side and the zero on the other side, that's what's important. Okay. Um, and so we can jump right into this formula now. But before we do that, what do we got to do? We got to do this A, B, C thing so that we know what we're going to be plugging in. Okay. Now I know some of you are looking at this and thinking, oh, I could do the factory method on this problem. Yeah, you're right. You can. But we're going to learn how to do the quadratic formula on it too. Okay. Uh, number one, just to see uh, different options here for different uh, options that you may have. Because in the future, sometimes you're going to have options, okay, where you're going to be able to choose. In these problems, all right, um, it says you have to use a quadratic formula, and that's why we're going to do that. Um, and there will be at least one question on the test where you have to use a quadratic formula too, so we do need to learn it, okay. But... Um, Yes, uh, in the future, you will have choices on which method you want to do on a lot of problems as well. And so it's good to see how different uh, methods do the problem so that you can then make an educated choice on which one you like best when you do have the choice. Okay. So anyway, we're going to do this with the quadratic formula. Uh, the A is 1 right there because that's 1W squared. The uh, B, which is the one that's attached to the uh, variable to the first power, in this case, w to the first power. That coefficient is negative 8. And then since the c term is missing, that's going to be 0. Okay, 0. So if the term is missing, like for example, if, the, if this term was missing, then the b would be 0. Okay, but in this case, it's the c. So again, don't say x right here. Say w since w is the variable. But the formula is still the same. Okay. Again, what does negative b mean, you guys? It means negative 1 times whatever the b is, which is negative 8. Negative 1 times negative 8 is positive 8. So I write down positive 8. And then I carefully, like I said in the last problem, carefully plug in the numbers into the part that's inside the radical here, like this. Okay. Um, and what it goes in there. Uh, negative 8. Again, very important you use a bracket here. You should always use a bracket when you're plugging something in, but especially important here because I see a lot of students not use a bracket here and they end up getting negative 64, but this is going to end up being positive 64. It completely ruins the problem when they don't use the bracket. Okay, so be careful there. Uh, and then A goes here and C goes here for AC. Okay. Underneath that, we have what? We have 2 times, and then you plug in whatever the A is. There we go. And then what did we learn in the last uh, problem as far as what to do after we plug in everything? We then have to do order of operations in order to figure out what this big fraction is equal to. Okay, so again, the bottom is the easy part. Just do 2 times 1. The top, what do we got to do first? We got to do the inside of the radical first, just like we did in the last problem. Inside of the radical first. Let me pull that over here. So that means what? Exponents, then multiplication, then subtraction, right? So the exponent is 64 again. Then we do negative 4 times 1 times 0, just like we did the negative 4 times 5 times negative 2 over here. Negative 4 times 1 times 0, well, anything times 0 is 0, right? 
And remember that's plus because it's plus the multiplication answer, like we said in the last problem. 64 plus 0 is 64. And so that's the inside of the radical, 64. Bring that back over here. But the difference between this problem and this problem is that, like I just mentioned a minute ago, this time we're going to get a number underneath the square root that is a perfect square. Okay, in fact, we're going to need some room here so I can do some work. All right, let me get that arrow out of the way there. But here's the thing. If the square root has a perfect square underneath it, figure out what the square root's equal to. Don't just simplify it, okay? Kind of similar to what we've been doing in the last few sections, okay? Uh, and the same thing we did in the first problem as well, okay? If you, if you have a square root that you can that you have a perfect square underneath it, figure it out, okay? Don't just try to do a simplifying thing. In fact, don't do that, okay? That's unnecessary. Um, what we do is we uh, just figure out what it's equal to, and that would be equal to 8, wouldn't it? So it would be 8 plus or minus 8 over 2. Now, here's the thing, you guys, that, that's very important that you need to understand, okay? Um, we don't just stop right here and say, hey, that's my answer, <laughs> okay? Okay. Um, Remember, order of operations means to go as far as you can, okay? Since 8 and 8 are, per, are uh, excuse me, since 8 and 8 are uh, like terms, these ones were not. The negative 8 was not like terms with this because this had a radical in it, and this one didn't. But these two terms are like terms. We can add and subtract these, can't we? So what does 8 plus or minus 8 mean then, since we can combine them together? They are like terms after all. What it means is that, remember I mentioned in a previous section, uh, the last couple of sections in fact, I mentioned that whenever you have plus or minus, that's two different answers. It's just that sometimes you can't compute them. You just have to leave it like this because right, there's, you, you can't combine those terms and all that. Um, but in this case, you can. So what you need to do in this case is you need to split it apart since they can be combined. So if the radical goes away, in other words, because you were able to compute the square root, you need to split it apart because you are able to combine these and actually get uh, simplified answers here. Not just a simplified radical, but a simplified answer where the radical is gone and you can just get a couple of normal fractions here. Um, what we do is this. 8 plus 8 over 2 and 8 minus 8 over 2. Remember, that's what plus or minus means. It means that we have two different answers where one of them has a plus right here and the other one has a minus right here, but the rest of the two answers are exactly the same. The 8, the 8, and the 2 are all the same in both answers. It's just that here you have a plus and here you have a minus. That's what the plus or minus means. So here's my two answers here. I just need to finish this off. Again, I'm still doing order of operations. I still want to figure out what the top is equal to. I already figured out the bottom, but I still need to figure out the top. Again, that's what you do when you have a fraction with no variables in it. Okay, You figure out what the top and bottom are equal to uh, until you get down to where you have just a single number on the top and bottom if you're able to make it that far. Over here, we weren't able to make it that far, but here we do. We can make it that far. All right. Here we get 16 on top and here we get 0 on top, right? And then you put it in lowest terms after that, after you get a single number on the top and bottom. What are those two answers going to be? Okay. Those two answers are going to be W. Sorry, my arrows are not very good there. Let me fix that. Um, there's the first one and then here's the second one. The first W is 16 over 2. That's going to be reduced down to 8 over 1, which is 8, right? 16 over 2 becomes 8. 0 divided by 2 is 0. Remember when the number on top is 0 and the one underneath it is not 0, that's when it's equal to 0. It's not undefined on that case. So here's my two answers. So let's review here. If you have a radical that does not have a perfect square underneath it, you just simplify the radical if, if that's possible, and then you're done. You can't go any further. If the radical does have a perfect square underneath it, you calculate it. We got 8 right here on the right. And then you do what I just did here, where you actually split it up into two parts. Because after you split it up, you will be able to combine these numbers together. 16 and 0 is what we got. And then you can then have your answers there for the fractions 
on the top and bottom, and then you just put the fractions in lowest terms. Okay, so those are the uh, two uh, main possibilities that you run into here, okay, in these problems with the, uh, with the uh, quadratic formula. Okay, moving on to problem C here, all right. Uh, what we got is, again, we have parentheses. And anytime that you have either a linear or quadratic equation, it doesn't matter which one it is, if you see parentheses at the beginning of the problem, um, you uh, get rid of them right away by multiplying them out. The only exception to that, as we saw, as I talked about it back in 10.1, is when you have a bracket being squared and you either are told to do the square root property or you decide to do the square root property. Maybe it's a problem where you have the choice and you decide to do that, okay? But if you're doing the square root property and you have a bracket being squared with a variable on the inside of it, in that case, do not distribute this out. See, normally this would be 5x plus 8 times 5x plus 8. And some students make the mistake of multiplying that out, 5x plus 8 times 5x plus 8. You don't do that in this case because you're doing the square root property. It's a different way. But in all the other linear or quadratic equations, you guys, if you see parentheses at the beginning, okay, you're going to get rid of those first. And so I'm going to do that here. And when we have two terms in a bracket times two terms in another bracket, as we saw at the very beginning of the semester, okay, that is when you have this thing where you go like this. Back in 6.3 is when we did this right here, okay, where you do the four different multiplications right here, when you have two terms in each bracket being, and the brackets are being multiplied in the middle here. What do we get if we do those four multiplications? We get 3n squared uh, minus 6n plus 4n and then minus 8, right? The other side doesn't have any parentheses, so I will just leave that as it is on this step. But then um, we need to move all the terms on what? We need to move all the terms on one side like we've been doing Anytime we do the quadratic formula, you just need to get rid of the brackets first, though. And we just did that. Which way do we want to move it? Do we want to move these terms over here? Or do, I, we, do we want to move the terms over here to the left? Which way do we want to go? Well, we're going to want to go moving everything over here to the right, because if you move the 2n squared with the 3n squared, the n squared will still be positive. Okay? And that, as I've said before, that... Uh, that's how the book does it. It's just easier to compare your answers to the book that way. Um, it's not completely mandatory with the quadratic formula to make the n squared a positive term, but it's just, like I said, it's easier that way. So since there's no parentheses left now, the way we move all the terms over is to take the terms that you're moving and add or subtract them over. Okay. Add or subtract them over. And we get what here? We get, uh, <clears throat> and it's okay to have the zero on the other side. It doesn't matter what side the zero is on. As long as you have a zero on one side of your problem with all the other terms on the other side. What do we get here? We get 3 minus 2 is 1, so that's 1n squared. Combining these three terms together here, we get minus 4n. And then combining these two right here, we get minus 4. Okay. Number one, we're not supposed to factor this. And number two, it doesn't factor anyway. I know it looks like it does, but it doesn't. Okay, so I'm just reminding you again, we're doing the quadratic formula here. So what do we got? We got uh, A, B, and C. Again, don't do the A, B, and C thing until you have all the terms on one side. And you've combined the terms. Notice how I combined all the like terms too. You should have only a maximum of three terms here. One of the n squared terms, one of the end of the first terms, and then one of the terms that doesn't have a variable in it, okay? Although either one of these two terms could sometimes be missing, like we saw in the last problem. But all the terms should be combined, though, as much as possible before you do the A, B, and C. That's why I combine like terms right here on all of these terms here. So anyway, A is 1, 1 n squared. B is negative 4 because it's negative 4 in, and then C is negative 4 also. Plugging all that in, we get what here? I'm going to move it over here so I have some room. Um, negative B means positive 4 because it's negative 1 times whatever B is equal to. Negative 1 times negative 4 is positive 4. 
put your plus or minus after that. Then we replace the B, the A, and the C with parentheses so that I can plug in the appropriate numbers after that. Okay, and so I put the B number, negative 4, right there. Okay, uh, then I put the A and C over here. Underneath that, we have 2 times whatever A is equal to. 2 times 1. Okay. What is the inside of the radical equal to? Okay, and I'm going to move that actually to a different spot so that I can, because I don't have any more room to write the next step here. Um, I am going to, where should I put that? Let me put that down here. Here we go. So, exponents first inside of the radical. Then I have multiplication. So negative 4 times 1 is negative 4. Times negative 4 is going to be positive 16. So I say 16 plus 16. Okay. Um, which is 32. And so we get what here? We get 4 plus or minus square root of 32 over 2. And then we uh, need to, after that, uh, look at the radical. And if it has a perfect square underneath it, then we do what we did in problem B just now. Uh, if it doesn't have a perfect square in it, then we just need to simplify it and we're pretty much done. Okay, 32 is not a perfect square, so I'm just going to simplify it. Okay, by saying 16 times 2, 16 is a factor of 32. And that gives me 4 on the outside there, doesn't it? Like that. And so I just replace the square root of 32 with its simplified equivalent here, which is 4 rad 2. And this is your final answer. Now, just like I mentioned in the last couple of sections, you guys, this is again a completely optional step, but as I mentioned in the last couple of sections, sometimes um, the uh, problem that uh, you get as a final answer, the textbook will take it one step further and simplify it a little bit more. Okay, um, this is no exception here. So this is completely acceptable. All right, like I said, if the radical does not have a perfect square underneath it, you just simplify it, replace the, replace the old radical with this, and then you're done. Okay, that is, you would get full credit on a test question if you did that, you're perfectly fine. But again, if you want to check your answers with the back of the book, all right, uh, and see if you're correct, and so you want your answers to come out uh, similar to the back of the book for that reason, uh, if that's uh, what you want to do, um, in order to just be extra sure that you did it right, uh, what the textbook does is they take it uh, a couple of steps further here, all right, um, and what they do is this. Uh, they factor and cancel. It's kind of like a, a problem that we did back in the factor chapter. I'm sorry, the fraction chapter, where you had a problem like this. Okay, and we learned that when you have two terms on top, you cannot cancel yet. You have to factor first. So that's got a GCF. I factor that out. Okay, and that creates two... Um, that creates two factors on the top here, right? Two factors on top. I'll use the colors here in case you prefer that, that we used before. Uh, and then since you got uh, four and two are single term factors here, you're allowed to cancel those and you get two over one. Okay, well this works the same way. Just remember, you're not allowed to factor out of the radical. You're not allowed to do that when you do this step here. So otherwise, it's the same thing. Just like you factored um, uh, 4 out of the 4 plus 4x, you would also would factor 4 out of this. And you would get 1 plus or minus rad 2. You see that there? Okay, the rad 2 is basically doing the same thing that the x is doing over here. It behaves the same way as a variable does. All right. Um, and so you factor just out of the 4 and the 4. You don't factor out of the radical. And then, again, uh, just like over here, the 4 and the 2 cancel for the same reason. They're single-term factors, okay? Uh, and we get 2 over 1, 
and so the final answer would be 2 and then on the inside 1 plus rad 2 and since the 1 is on the bottom you don't need to write it so this is what the back of the book will say but this again if you give this as an answer you get full credit okay so it's optional these last couple steps but I just wanted to share that with you so that you didn't look at the back of the book and say to yourself why are their answers coming out different than mine okay now you know that um, the textbook likes to do this these last two steps here okay that would have also worked on this one as well so a lot of these problems and I won't do that right here you now know what to do okay you would factor a GCF out of not out of the 26 but out of the negative 8 and the 2 okay and then cancel that GCF with the 10 all right that's how it works all right um, and so uh, You'll see that on at least one of the problems here coming up as well that I'm going to ask you to do. So, uh, but again, it's optional if you want to do it. All right. So, um, all right. One more here before I let, have you guys try some here. Negative x squared, and then these two terms over here. We need to have them all on one side, right? So I need to move all the terms on one side, but I need the x squared term to be positive. I also need the terms to be in this order right here, right? Okay. And then what is the a, b, and c numbers? Now that I've put them all in the correct order and they're all on the same side and all that. They are 1, negative 5, and 20. So let's plug them in. Negative B would be negative 1 times negative 5. Positive 5. Plus or minus what? Put your parentheses here first and then put the numbers in, the appropriate numbers. So we get negative 5 for B. 1 for A. 20 for C. Okay. And underneath that, 2 times whatever the A number is, 2 times 1. Great. Okay. Now, something unusual happens here, though, but it's something we've seen before. We then figure out the inside of the radical, right? We also figure out the bottom, but I'll write that on the next step here. Actually, I'll write it right now. That's fine. Uh, so the bottom is 2, right? And then on the top, we have 5 plus or minus the square root of, and then we still need to figure out the inside. That's the next step here. The exponent is 25. We do that before the multiplication, as you know. But here's where it gets uh, a little bit different than what we've seen in this section so far. Negative 4 times 1 is negative 4. And then negative 4 times uh, 20 is negative 80. So this would be 25 plus whatever this was equal to, uh, 25 plus negative 80. As you guys know, when you have a number plus a negative number, you can just say minus 80 instead. All right. So 25 minus 80, what's that equal to? Your calculator will figure this out for you if you like. Uh, negative 55. Negative 55. What's the problem with a negative number right here? Okay, well, as we saw back in section 10.1, um, when you get the variable by itself, which we already have by itself here, okay, uh, when you get the variable by itself and it's equal to an answer that has a negative inside of the radical, all right, you figure out the inside of the radical, they figure out the whole thing, and it's just equal to a negative number, okay, that means that there is no solution because you can't have the square root of a negative number. There is no answer to that, right? So because that radical is negative there, we once again say no solution. You don't have to do anything else because we already know that there's not going to be an answer because you can't have a square root with a negative number underneath in order to have an actual answer. Okay, so um, again, similar to 10.1 right there. So please try right now problems 1 and 2 and then also try um, 3 and 4 on the second page. 
All right, we'll see how those come out. And then we will look at uh, this last part here where we kind of summarize all the different methods for solving a quadratic equation. So hit the play button when you're done with those four problems and we'll see how they come out. Okay, let's take a look at number one right here. See how the terms are already in the correct order. They're all on the same side with zero on the other side. So I went ahead and jumped right into figuring out what A, B, and C were equal to. I plugged them into their appropriate positions, okay? And uh, as usual, I then figured out what the inside of the radical was equal to first. I also figured out the denominator, okay? Um, and I wrote down plus negative four right here just to emphasize that it is plus negative four times whatever you multiply by it over here. Uh, you don't have to write it that way as long as you know that it's plus negative four but uh, we end up getting plus negative 16. You can write minus 16, that's fine, same thing. Uh, and either way though, you end up with 33, and that's why I just moved it up into here. Uh, the reason why I stopped right here and did nothing else was because 33 is not a perfect square number like 25 or 36 would be. And so you just have to simplify that radical in order to uh, finish off the problem. Uh, but it's already simplified. 33 is not a radical you can simplify. And so that's why I circled it as is. So that was a pretty short problem right there. Number two, remember you have to move over that five to get all the terms on one side. We got that right here. Okay, then we figure out what the A, B, and C numbers are. We plug them into their appropriate positions. We figure out what the denominator is equal to, and we also figure out what the inside of the radical is. Okay, we end up getting 104 inside the radical. Okay, again, 104, as we learned earlier, is the type of radical that does not have, uh, a, it's not a perfect square number, so you just simplify it. And we ended up, as we got in problem A at the very top, no need to do it again. We already simplified that radical earlier. Uh, it's equal to 2 rad 26. And so there's your final answer right there. Yes, this is one of those problems where the back of the book has a different looking answer because they do, they do the two extra steps that I talked about. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. Okay. Um, but um, hold on just a minute here. I want to see if I did that on the... Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. So... Um, so you don't uh, need to do what the back of the book did, but just for practice here, um, let me do it one more time here, just for those of you that are wondering how I did that on, that, on problem uh, C. Uh, what you do is you don't factor out of the 26, but you factor out of the negative 12 and the 2. And what's the GCF of negative 12 and 2? it would be 2, wouldn't it? So you go like this. You factor out the 2, but don't change the 26. The 26 stays the same. And you just factor out of the negative 12, which would give you negative 6 on the inside. And then you factor out of the 2, so that would be 1 right there. You could write the 1 right there, or you could just write the square root of 26, because we know that when there's nothing in front of the radical there, uh, it means that it, there's an invisible 1 there. Okay, but you can write the one there if you want. And then, uh, just like I said earlier, you then take the GCF and you cancel it with the term on the bottom here. Okay, and so the final answer, if you were looking at the back of the book, would be uh, negative 6. And remember, there's a 1 on the outside of the uh, bracket on the top, one outside the parenthesis. And when you have a one and that's all you have on the outside of a parenthesis, you don't need to write the parenthesis. And you don't need to write the one either. Because you're just multiplying by one, it's not going to change anything. If it's anything else other than one, as we've talked about before, then the parenthesis is still important there. Okay. Uh, but if it's being multiplied by positive one and that's, uh, that's all that's on the outside of the parenthesis, you can get rid of the parenthesis and just write down the inside of the parenthesis. And you get two on the bottom there, as we mentioned right here. So this is what the back of the book is going to say. This is what you are allowed to say, okay? Um, and so those, those are your two different options there. Let's keep moving here uh, to problem uh, on the second page here, problem number three. 
All the terms are already in the appropriate position. I plug in the appropriate A, B, and C numbers. I figure out the denominator and also figure out the inside of the radical. 49. Then you do your multiplication and you get 49 plus negative 160. Same thing as 49 minus 160 if you prefer it that way. But that's equal to negative 111. What's wrong with that? As we saw with the negative 55 answer in problem D on the first page, all right, that means that you have no solution because you cannot have the square of a negative number in your answer, all right? And this is our answer because X is by itself, okay? Um, finally, number four, we need to move all the terms to one side, preferably to keep the X squared term positive, so I move the 11X over, all right? Uh, and uh, again, you don't have to write down this plus zero right here, but it just reminds us that the C term is missing. Okay, the term that doesn't have the variable in it, that's missing here. Just like in problem uh, B on the first page. So the C is zero. We got the eight and the negative 11. And we plug those things in right here. Okay. And... So that kind of came out, uh, let me make that a little bit easier to see there. There we go. Uh, the negative. All right, so then we figure out what the inside of the radical is equal to. We also figure out the bottom. The bottom is 16. All right, the inside of the radical is 121. And then you multiply negative 4 times 8 times 0, which is 0. And so the inside of the radical is 121, which is a perfect square. Okay, just like that problem we did in problem B on the first page. And what did we do when we had a perfect square underneath the radical after we figured out the inside? Uh, we actually calculated the square root, which meant that we had to keep going because these are like terms now. We can't just stop if they're like terms. So just like you did on the front, you figure out the top of each of the two new fractions you got. Okay, why do we have two fractions? It's because of the plus or minus symbol. It means that we need to have one fraction for the plus and then another fraction for the minus. Okay, 11 plus 11 gives me 22 over 16. 11 minus 11 gives me 0 over 16. We put those two answers in lowest terms after we get a single number on the top and bottom. Okay, don't put it in lowest terms until after that. Okay, when you do an order of operations and there's no variables. Okay, um, so we end up getting 11 eighths. And zero. So those are your two answers, and that's why I circled that. Okay. So that, you guys, is the quadratic formula. Okay, so once more as a reminder, you guys, when you have this next test coming up, there will be at least one problem where you have to do the square root property from 10.1. There will be at least one problem where you have to use the completing the square from 10.2. And there will be at least one problem where you have to use the quadratic formula from this current section. There will also be problems um, in uh, that are similar to problems that are later in this packet. Let me just show you an example here. See, it, it, we'll get to this. Don't worry. All right. Don't worry about it. Don't be intimidated by all of this yet. Okay. Uh, and don't be intimidated at all, but uh, we'll get through this. All right. Don't be thrown off by this. But just to show you, this is a problem from the next section that we're going to do in the next video. You can see that we did all these steps here. Okay, and we'll go through this carefully again. All right, but see how we ended up with a quadratic equation here with the y squared? When that happens, you guys, in the middle of a problem, okay, not at the beginning of the problem do you have a quadratic equation, but in the middle of the problem. When that happens, you guys, you will then have the choice of which method you want to do. Uh, which of the four methods you want to use to solve the quadratic equation. And I'm going to talk right now about which, how, how to best make the, the best decision on which method to use. I'm going to talk about that. But it will be your choice. Okay, and here, what I want to point out to you is that usually, when not always, but usually when it is your choice, at least for the rest of this packet anyway, uh, when you have the choice, usually uh, the factoring method is best. Again, not always, but usually. So 
um, you're going to want to remember to know how to do the factory method, even though we got tested on that on the last test. You're going to want to remember that method and remember how to do it because it's going to help you on some of these problems throughout the remainder of our current packet. So my point is, is that you definitely want to know how to use all four methods, okay, including the factory method that we learned in the previous packet. Just want to make that clear, okay. Now let's go back to... The last four problems that you see on our current packet, or our current section, rather, uh, it's these ones right here. And notice what it says here. It says, which method is best to use when solving each quadratic equation? So I'm going to talk to you right now about what my opinion is. And again, this is just my opinion since, since this is mainly dealing with what you should do when you have the choice of what method to do. Okay. Again, you don't have to follow my opinion in this case because, again, this is about what to do when you have the choice. But just to give you my opinion since I'm your teacher, okay, um, this is what I think is the best approach to take, to take when you have the choice of which method to use. Okay. Um, now, first of all, how do you even know that these things are quadratic equations? Let's say you're, you're let's say you're doing a problem and you don't, and they don't tell you it's a quadratic equation. How do you know that these are? Well, B, C, and D, you can see that both of those problems, uh, or all three of those problems, have the x squared, the x squared, and the y squared in it, right? And that's that there's no parentheses or anything. There's just a polynomial on each side of the equal sign. When that happens, when you have a polynomial on each side of the equal sign, no parentheses or anything, and the highest exponent attached to the variable is 2, that's automatically quadratic. However... What about this, though? I don't see an x squared in this problem. That's true, but as I mentioned before, when you have um, a situation where you have parentheses, you got to ask yourself, what would be the biggest exponent that you would have uh, if you got rid of the parentheses? I'm not saying you should get rid of the parentheses here when you actually solve the problem, but for the sake of figuring out what kind of equation it is, uh, what would be the largest exponent if we did get rid of the parentheses and we had just a polynomial on each side of the equal sign like we do in these other problems? Well, if I multiply this out, and you don't literally have to, but I think you can see here just by looking at this, you can see that if I multiplied this out in order to get rid of these parentheses here, uh, there would be an x squared in here, wouldn't there? You get x squared, and then you get 3x, and 3x, and then you get 9 right here when you multiply all that out. The largest exponent would be 2, wouldn't it? Okay. Uh, and then even after you multiplied by the 2 there, it still would be. So my point is, is that um, this is quadratic as well. Right? So... Again, when you have the choice, they're usually not going to tell you that it's uh, what kind of equation it is. Um, and so it's good to be able to recognize what kind of equation you have before you decide what method to do. So these are all definitely quadratic. Okay, now what method should you do on all of these? All right. It says if you can easily write the equation in this form, and that also means this form as well if you can easily get it into this form as well, where you have either a variable squared equal to no variable on the other side, that's what the constant means, a variable squared by itself equal to no variable on the other side, and, or if you have a bracket squared by itself on one side of the equal sign with, again, no variable on the other side. If you can easily get it into one of those two forms, do the square root property. This is what uh, I mean. This is uh, how you want to approach this. Okay, look at uh, the four problems we have here. Uh, if you're thinking about doing the square root property, look at wherever the variable is being squared or uh, if it's a bracket being squared, look at that. Don't look at anything else. Just look at the variable being squared or the bracket being squared. Don't include the two here. Don't include the two here. Just the variable being squared or the bracket being squared. Which one of these four problems, you guys, which one of these four can you get the box that I just highlighted here by itself without having a variable on the other side? Well, the way to figure that out, okay, is look at the four boxes I made here. 
which one of these problems has no variable outside of the box? Which one of these four problems, or which ones, has no variable outside the box? This one has no variable outside the box, right? It has 2, negative 8, and 12. No variable outside the box. Uh, this one down here has no variable outside the box. It has 2 plus 3 and 17. But these two problems do. Okay, it's when you have a variable outside of that box, you know, the box that we made back in 10.1 when we were trying to get, get it by itself so we can do either this thing right here or this thing right here and doing the square root property thing. Okay, it's that box, if there's a variable outside of it, then, or like there is in problem B and C, if there's a variable outside that box, don't do the square root property. Because if I move the 2x over to the other side to get the x squared by itself, you're going to have a variable on the other side. You can't have a variable on the other side if you're going to do the square root property. Okay? But in problems A and D, there's no variable on the other side. So I can easily get it, maybe not, uh, easily is kind of a relative term. Then the point is, is that you can get the box by itself and then do the square root property. We learned how to do that in 10.1 right here. All right, you move over the 8, and then you divide out the 2. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to do this whole problem here, but I just want to show you that you, you can do the square root property here. I'm just doing this the same way I did it in 10.1. All right. And you get this right here. So again, the problem does not say to solve the problem. It just says which method is best. So I'm just proving to you here that the square root property is the best. At least in my opinion. Okay. So that's all that we wanted to figure out right there. You don't have to actually finish the problem right there. Okay. Same thing down here in problem D. Because there's no variable outside of that box, the same box that we made back in 10.1 when we had to get it by itself, uh, that means that you can, usually without too much difficulty, get the variable by itself here, okay? I'm sorry, not the variable by itself, but the box by itself, and then do the what? The square root property, okay? Now, that's the first thing that you ask yourself when you're given the choice on which method to use for quadratic equations. Try to see if you can get either the variable squared by itself without having a variable on the other side, like we did in problem D, or if you've got a bracket being squared with a variable on the inside, see if you can get that by itself by without having a variable on the other side after you get it by itself. Okay, ask yourself that, whether it's a variable squared or a bracket squared. And you usually will be able to if there's no variables outside the box. And so that's a good approach to take. Now, if that's not the case, as, as it is with problems B and C right here, if you're not able to get the box by itself uh, without, having a, without a variable appearing on the other side, then what you do <clears throat> is you go to step two right here. It says, otherwise... Write all the terms on one side of the equation with zero on the other side. Okay. Uh, clear the parentheses first if there are any. There aren't any in these two problems, but you would do that in this case. Okay. Um, so if I move over the three right there, okay, to get all the terms on one side, remember you want to make, at least in this case, and you'll see why here in a second, but in this case here, you want to make the x squared positive, like we talked about uh, with a couple of the methods that we did, which is what we're going to be focusing on here is those same two methods, the factory method and the quadratic formula. You want to make the x squared positive, and you want to put it in descending order of degree, x squared, x to the first, constant, if all those terms are there. Same thing over here. You want to move all the terms to one side, so that they are all in descending order, and so that the x squared is positive, just like we talked about, again, with the quadratic formula and also with the factory method. Then what you do is, again, this is if you have the choice on which method to use, it says you try to factor the non-zero side, if you can. So that means you try, okay? 
you try to factor it so that you can then find the solutions from the factors, all right? Uh, in section 7.5, the factoring uh, section, we were able to factor this. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. Um, and then um, we need the numbers to add up to 2 in the middle, so negative 1 and 3 will work right there. And so we were able to factor this. And then we can set those factors equal to zero like we did in 7.5. And so the factoring method will work here. Again, you don't have to finish solving this problem here. They didn't ask you to solve it. We just want to know what method would work. So I'll just say the factoring method. Can I factor this? 1 times negative 5. Again, I'm going to try to do the Berry method here because of how it's set up. It's set up for the Berry method. Do any numbers add up to 2 from negative 5? No, negative 1 and 5 wouldn't work. That would add up to 4, wouldn't it? 1 and negative 5, no, that doesn't work. Okay, that adds up to negative 4. So that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Okay, and so this is a prime, isn't it? That's a prime polynomial. Barry method doesn't work. There's no GCF either to factor out. Okay. So if you can't factor it down to a point where you can set the factors equal to zero and solve it, then you don't want to do the factoring method. But doesn't this look like the quadratic formula, potentially? And so that's my point. If you can factor, then do that. Otherwise, you can fall back as a last option since it doesn't factor. Let me write this down. Since factoring doesn't work, Again, this is my opinion, but my opinion is that factoring is easier than the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula is kind of messy, right? Okay, but since the factoring doesn't work, we can, as a last option, at least, better than not having any option, quadratic formula is what I'm going to use. Okay, so let's review. Try to do the square root property, and we talked about how to recognize when the square root property is a good idea. Problems A and D here. Otherwise, you move all the terms to one side, you put them in the correct order here. All right, make sure the x squared is positive. If the x squared is not positive, then you move all the terms over to the other side, and that will make it positive. You then try to factor the what you got. All right. If you're able to factor it into some factors that you can use to solve when you set them equal to zero, like we did in 7.5, then you do the factoring method. You know, like when we did x minus 1 equal to zero and x plus 3 equal to zero, that, that method, right? But if it doesn't factor, then you can still fall back on the quadratic uh, formula, and that will give you the answer. You might notice here that I never mentioned completing the score. That's the one method I didn't mention. That does not mean that completing the score is bad, okay? It's going to be useful moving forward, especially when you move on into Math 71, uh, Intermediate Algebra. You'll see that more. It's good to know it, okay? Plus, you might be under the opinion that uh, uh, you like it better than I like it, all right? Uh, I happen to think that it's not the easier method in any case, uh, any case you're going to run into normally, but uh, that's just my opinion, okay? So... Um, it's your choice here when you're given the choice, obviously. So, uh, but I just wanted to let you know why I didn't mention that there. It's just in my opinion, uh, normally that's not the best, uh, that's not the easiest choice. All right, but it does have its uses Mo uh, moving forward. It, it will have its uses. Okay, so that concludes uh, our uh, discussion, not only on the quadratic formula, but on solving quadratic equations in general. Um, and uh, moving into the next uh, few videos coming up, uh, we'll see some equations um, that uh, will be neither linear nor quadratic. However, they will transform into linear and quadratic equations halfway through the problem. I showed you an example of that a few minutes ago. And so because of that, um, we still really want to make sure we remember uh, how to do linear and quadratic equations moving forward. And of course, you're going to want to know that uh, for the upcoming test anyway. So let's make sure we keep that fresh in our mind about how to do those types of equations. All right. But uh, otherwise, you have a great day. And uh, let me know if you have any questions about any of this. And so that you'll be uh, adequately prepared for uh, the problems that uh, we see in future videos. Okay. Uh, so have a good day. And uh, we'll see you back for the next video.